Good morning and welcome to this Euractiv virtual conference. My name is Sean Golding Carroll. I'm a journalist covering transport and environment issues, and I'll be the moderator for this discussion. So today's event is supported by IWABA, the European Waste-Based and Advanced Biofuels Association, and is titled Refueling Aviation, the Role and Types of Sustainable Aviation Fuels. Aviation has revolutionized connectivity in Europe, but greater air travel has come with an environmental cost. Prior to the pandemic-driven downturn, aviation accounted for 3.8% of total CO2 emissions in the EU. To meet its ambitious climate goals, such as its aim to reduce emissions across the bloc by 55% by 2030, the European Commission has proposed a number of policies aimed at cutting the aviation industry's carbon footprint, including refuel EU aviation. This regulation proposes a Sustainable Aviation Fuel, or SAF, mandate which would require all planes refueling at EU airports to uplift a set percentage of SAFs. The proposal has provoked strong debate among stakeholders, with some welcoming it as a necessary green step, and others raising concerns of market distortions and the ring fencing of scarce feedstock. Today, we'll dive into this debate and discuss the role SAFs can play in decarbonizing European aviation. But first, I'd like to introduce today's panelists. I'm delighted to be joined by Philip Cornelis, Director of Aviation with the European Commission's DG MOVE, Daniel Villela Oliveira, a Policy Officer with the German Federal Ministry for the Environment, Nature Conservation and Nuclear Safety, Chelsea Baldino, a researcher with the International Council on Clean Transportation, Thomas Reinhardt, Managing Director of Airlines for Europe, the EU's largest airline association, and Michael fiedler Paniotopoulos, the president of IWABA. So to kick off, I'll invite each panelist to provide a short opening statement, which will then be followed by a Q&A session. This Q&A session will include questions uh, from our viewers. So if you at home or perhaps in the office, if you have a question for our uh, panelists, you're warmly encouraged to submit it through the chat. So firstly, this morning, I would like to give the floor to Philip Cornelis, Director of Aviation with DG Move. Philip, your opening statement, please. Thank you very much, Sean, and um, very good morning also from my side to everybody, and thanks for joining um, this discussion. Well, as you were mentioning already, Sean, um, our focus now is on helping the aviation sector to decarbonize itself as part of our overall effort across the economy to reach the minus 55 by 2030 and carbon neutrality by the middle of this century. And the Commission, as you said, uh, adopted a series of proposals in July as part of the so-called Fit for 55 package. And several of those will directly impact uh, the aviation sector and hopefully push it in that direction of decarbonization. First of all, there is the uh, revision of the ETS uh, directive. Um, secondly, we are proposing to implement in Europe the uh, ICAO Corsia uh, offsetting scheme. Then also there is a proposal to revise the energy taxation directive and introduce a tax on kerosene. Um, there is a, a proposal on the alternative fuels infrastructure that will also deal with electricity provision at airports. And finally, there is a proposal on sustainable fuels, uh, which is coming from my uh, department, uh, because indeed, if we want to decarbonize, particularly in the short to medium term, we need to work uh, primarily on uh, changing the aviation fuel mix that is still almost 100% consisting of uh, fossil fuels. In the long term, we are looking forward to zero emission aircraft using renewable electricity or hydrogen. Uh, but uh, in the meantime, we will need to rely on uh, drop in fuels, uh, liquid fuels, uh, and certainly in the long run, even also for long haul, this remain, remain an important part of the fuel mix. Hence, our focus on uh, pushing uh, sustainable aviation fuels, they could reduce by themselves the in-sector emissions by around 60% by the middle of the century. Uh, and they are compatible with uh, today's aircraft engines. There are eight pathways uh, already certified for uh, use in, uh, in aviation fuel. Uh, and in fact, already more than 360,000 flights have taken place with uh, SAF uh, on board uh, since 2009. 
Nevertheless, production uh, and uh, use are still negligible, uh, close to 0.05%. Uh, uh, and this is because production costs are high. Uh, uh, airlines, uh, of course, facing very uh, strong competition between them uh, and uh, have difficulty to absorb those higher prices. Uh, and also because there is a uh, lack of a clear policy framework uh, focusing on aviation, even though we do have a general uh, policy framework on renewable energy in transport. So we've seen so far there's no business case for the uptake uh, of SAF in aviation. And in order to break that uh, chicken and egg situation, uh, we are proposing uh, to introduce across Europe a blending mandate, uh, with, uh, which has shown uh, from our consultations prior to the proposal uh, that it is uh, very much supported by the industry, uh, both by the fuels industry and the airlines, uh, but also by a group of leading member states. The objective of this proposal is to provide market certainty on supply and demand. Uh, we will increase gradually that uh, mandate over time, starting with 2% blend uh, in 2025, so very quickly after the adoption of this legal framework rising to 5% in 2030 uh, and all the way up to 63% by the middle of the century. And this will ensure that airlines uh, take up uh, those uh, fuels uh, while uh, ensuring a level playing field for all airlines uh, and airports. And we hope and expect that uh, the scale up will uh, result in a production cost decrease over time uh, and the development of uh, new fuels such as uh, synthetic fuels. Other Fit for 55 measures will also address the price gap, ETS, zero rating, uh, the zero minimum rate for uh, fuel taxation, and of course the incentives under the International Corsia scheme. Uh, and we will pursue also the uptake of sustainable fuels globally because we are in a global uh, sector uh, and working with ICAO and other countries uh, for them to move in a similar direction at uh, global scale to ensure uh, in the long run a level playing field also for our aviation sector. Back to you, Sean. Thank you, Philip, for this overview of the Commission's proposals. Um, next up, we'll move to Daniel Vilela Oliveira. Daniel, the floor is yours. Yes, uh, good morning, everyone um, from, uh, from Bonn. Uh, Germany commits to to uh, to its climate targets. Um, whether those are um, ambitious enough is uh, something that is uh, obviously up for debate, and also uh, one of the things uh, the next our next government um, has to decide. Uh, however, in order to cut the emissions and to reach the targets we already set in uh, in our national law which is 65% um, co2 reduction by 2030 and complete climate neutrality by 2045 um, every sector must do its part and um, while germany already cut its emissions by 40% compared to 1990 uh, transport emissions in germany stayed more or less the same so vehicles got somewhat um, more efficient However, demand increased. Um, and uh, while aviation in Germany accounts for roughly 20% of uh, fuel consumption, up until now, there was no instrument that um, addresses CO2 emissions in aviation and reduces them significantly. Um, that is why uh, Germany already introduced a mandate this year by an act of parliament in May uh, that obliges fuel suppliers uh, to, to use a minimum share of renewable aviation fuels. Um, it, it starts in 2026 with half a percent and increases in 2028 to 1% and 2% 2 in 2030. Um, while this is certainly not the first mandate uh, in the EU in aviation in the member state, it is the first one to only include RFMBOs or synthetic aviation fuels and we did that for two reasons first of all for the promotion of this new and very important technology Germany also has an ambitious uh, hydrogen strategy and promoting RFMBOs in aviation is beneficial 
um, for for the technology in general, for for um, hydrogen production and other sectors as well. Um, and the second reason is that biomass is limited. Um, promoting renewable energy sources uh, is only beneficial when um, those sources are not being used um, already in other sectors. So um, overall, uh, we uh, um, in general, we, we welcome the proposal uh, by the Commission for an EU-wide obligation of fuels. Um, and uh, as I said, uh, aviation also has to do its part uh, and a uniform overall targets um, ensure a level playing field in the Re European Union, which we also welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Um, now I'll hand over to Chelsea Baldino of ICCT. Chelsea, your opening remarks, please. Yes, thank you, Sean, for having me. So we were very happy to see that the Refuel EU proposal only supports the use of advanced fuels made of wastes and residues, as well as synthetic aviation fuels, also known as power to liquids, and that it doesn't support food and feed-based fuels because this aligns with what the research has consistently shown is necessary to achieve decarbonization. However, in the near term, in 2025 and 2030, we've identified a risk that existing commercialized HEFA fuels, um, those made from waste, waste oils, such as used cooking oil, may be used to meet the entirety of the SAF mandates outside of the um, mandatory power to liquids sub-mandate. This is because these fuels are much less expensive to produce since they are commercial. Excuse me. Um, sorry. Oh my gosh. Um, and apologies. Um, sorry. So this will lead to two problems. First, these waste oils are already being used in the road sector and diverting them may not provide a net benefit for the climate at all. And second, um, waste oils will not be available at the scale needed to meet long-term refuel, refuel EU AB ambition. Um, basically, HEFA fuels are a completely different technology from those needed to produce e-fuels or advanced fuels. Um, so if HEFA fuels are receiving policy support in the short, short term, we could be crowding out investment in nascent technologies necessary to scale up SAF production in Europe. So we have two suggestions. First, cap waste oil fuels at 1.7%, which is already something that we see in the Renewable Energy, Energy Directive. And second, we suggest that policy support is only provided for less developed technologies, which are needed to convert Annex 9A wastes and residues, as well as synthetic aviation fuels. Thanks, and sorry for the distraction. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. Thank you, Chelsea. Um, now we'll go to Thomas Reinhardt to share the airlines for your perspective. Thomas, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Sean, and thanks uh, for your to your, your active for having uh, me on this panel this morning. Uh, I just made sure uh, my phone is uh, switched off, so uh, no worries. Um, uh, first of all, uh, just to state, environmental uh, viability overall is absolutely critical for the aviation industry. And I think uh, also Philippe alluded to that before. Um, it is absolutely critical uh, really for us to be able to recover and grow again on a sustainable basis. Uh, it's uh, very clear that we want to recover in a sustainable uh, manner, uh, more resiliently uh, from the COVID-19 uh, crisis, which is uh, the worst crisis ever in, in aviation. Um, so doing that while at the same time supporting uh, Europe's Green Deal objectives uh, in parallel with the um, recovery efforts from COVID-19. Just as a reminder, um, the airline industry, by the way, was the first sector to um, agree uh, to globally reduce its uh, net carbon emissions uh, with the introduction of an emissions cap from 2020 uh, and a 50% net cut by 20, uh, 2050. Um, aviation is also the first uh, industry worldwide to set up a, a global uh, carbon offsetting scheme, which we know is Corsia today, uh, to help us really reach these goals. Um, from a European perspective, uh, really amidst the toughest crisis we're undergoing, uh, in February of this year, Europe's entire aviation sector um, um, announced a joint commitment uh, to work with policymakers to achieve net zero CO2 emissions by 2050 
uh, through our Destination 2050 roadmap. Uh, so it's a huge commitment on at all levels of, of the companies of the entire aviation sector, so not only the airlines, uh, up until the CEO level. Um, and the uh, national and European authorities are well aware of that. Now, these commitments will help us build a greener, um, I think also more socially and economically robust future for aviation, which is important uh, going forward. However, to, to deliver these uh, net emissions reductions, we do need uh, policy support across uh, four key areas, as Destination 2050 clearly defines. Uh, one is uh, more efficient uh, operations by reforming Europe's airspace management. And again, Philip knows very well what I'm talking about here. I'm talking about getting single European sky finally adopted uh, and done and executed. Uh, secondly, we need uh, support uh, for new aircraft and engine technologies, which includes also electric and hydrogen technologies. Uh, third, we really need to uh, have a massive scaling up of sustainable aviation fuels. Uh, and here we believe that Europe has an opportunity to take the lead globally. Uh, and last but not least, of course, the economic measures, uh, including EUTS and Corsia, uh, but also greenhouse gas removal technologies such as carbon capture and storage um, uh, will remain important for, for some time. There's no single part of, uh, of the aviation ecosystem that can achieve uh, these targets on its own. Uh, success really requires here a joint uh, and coordinated industry and a pan-European government effort. Uh, I will leave that, that for my introductory remarks for now, John. Thanks. Thank you very much indeed, Thomas. Um, now I'll pass the floor to Michael Fiedler Paniotopoulos, the president of IWABA. Uh, Michael, the floor is yours. Thank you, Sean. Uh, it's really great that on this panel we all share the same objective, to decarbonize transport and specifically aviation. Uh, next to being the president of Evaba, I represent Renewable Energy Group and we were the first to produce SAF from lipids in North America. So we know uh, what we're talking about. Uh, so what unites us here again is to decarbonize uh, transport, um, the, but the devil is in the detail. So we appreciate that the Commission has tried uh, and, at, and attempts uh, to decarbonize aviation. The problem we see is that the impact assessment supporting this proposal is unfortunately completely wrong. It uh, mentions no volumes about availability uh, of feedstock and uh, the um, assertion that there will be enough feedstock without any substantiation um, is puzzling uh, to us. Um, in terms of volumes, um, independent sources like the reputable consultancy LMC in London see that globally, we will have 15 million tons of waste lipids. And what the commission is proposing um, in, all, in all the proposals for the fifth, Fit for 55 will be a use of 11 to 12 million tons of waste lipids. So we're not alone in the world. And the figures I mentioned here are from transport and environment. It's, they are not from um, Evaba. So, we see an issue that the proposal of the commission is just a waste lipids proposal that will divert biomolecules from terrestrial uses to aviation. And unfortunately, it's much more efficient to convert the same biomolecules for road or shipping than to do that for aviation. So the EU will be increasing its GHG emissions by millions of tons if this uh, proposal goes ahead in uh, the European Parliament and uh, the European Council. So we see environmental damage and also we see a, a economic damage because um, around 50 plus uh, smaller biorefineries will need to close down uh, their access to feedstock uh, will cease, uh, and that will be in favor of three, four big heifer 
producers. So that can't be right, and uh, we doubt that um, um, it um, supports the, the general policy of the EU to support SMEs. Let me be clear, we are not asking to exclude waste lipids from aviation. We advocate for a fair level playing field in which waste lipids are not included in a separate blending mandate that will ring fence the market for three to four major refiners with waste HVO HEFA production capacity. And I was glad to hear from Mr. Cornelis that there are eight pathways to produce SAF. Therefore, we question why this proposal focuses uh, nearly exclusively on waste lipids. Uh, we see the example of the UK, and we also heard the example of Germany. The UK supports novel pathways and doesn't exclude lipids from aviation. It just doesn't extra incentivize it. It. And therefore, I repeat, we are for a level playing field of technologies uh, to decarbonize the transport across the three sectors of the transport, aviation, road and shipping. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. I'm sure we'll pick up uh, those points in our discussion. Well, we can now move on to the uh, question and answer portion of the event. Um, maybe then just picking up on what you said, Michael. Um, so, Philip, I'd be interested to hear your reaction to this. So, there are concerns that the, uh, the SAF mandate as proposed will divert scarce waste feedstocks uh, towards aviation, leaving a shortfall perhaps for the production of biofuels uh, to decarbonize maritime and road transport. Um, what's your response uh, to this concern? Well, this is a very well-known concern uh, that Tewaba has been very vocal in, in um, <clears throat> putting forward since the beginning of our consultations on this uh, initiative. <clears throat> and we've looked in, into this very carefully uh, because obviously we don't want to, um, to plunder one uh, sector just to feed another one. Uh, we looked, we've looked into this very carefully uh, in our impact assessment. I would definitely encourage everybody to uh, study this um, so uh, that they will see that uh, the the claim that was just made there is no substantiation for our proposal uh, that uh, this is absolutely uh, uh, unfair and incorrect so what we what we have found is that um, the biofuels uh, for the road sector <clears throat> today are produced for about 80 percent with a crop feedstock and we've decided not to make uh, crop feedstock eligible for our uh, aviation mandate. So clearly uh, that part of the uh, biodiesel um, sector will be completely unaffected by our proposal. Um, and as far as waste oils are concerned, we don't expect all of them uh, to be directed uh, to aviation. We have to also keep in mind the question of scale. The, the aviation fuels market is much, much smaller then the road fuels market we're talking about much smaller uh, volumes plus our blending targets are also not uh, very large in the in the beginning um, uh, but we do need the uh, hefa pathway uh, for the production of SAF for the beginning uh, for the coming years and and decade while the other uh, pathways are being scaled up. HEFA is the most uh, mature uh, production method, and we do need also access to that uh, for the aviation sector. Uh, in our impact assessment, we've come to the conclusion that um, the shift from uh, road fuels to aviation fuels would be around 3% only by uh, 2030, uh, and 6% by uh, 2050, so absolutely um, uh, manageable, particularly uh, as we are looking at a massive electrification of road transport in the coming years and no doubt a reduced reliance over time uh, on uh, biodiesel. Um, and uh, we expect that uh, our SAF mandate would uh, require about 28% of the available used cooking oil uh, in the EU by 2030. Um, but um, we should also keep in mind that uh, also animal fats can be used for, uh, for HEFA. 
so uh, we don't necessarily uh, need those 28 percent of of cooking oil uh, and we do expect that the um, blending mandate uh, that we uh, are proposing together with the increased ambition in the renewable energy directive that our energy colleagues have proposed that those two proposals will also stimulate uh, production capacity uh, in Europe uh, and will also stimulate uh, a better harvesting uh, of the uh, the waste uh, oils uh, in Europe than is the case today. There's still a very large untapped um, amount of feedstock in, in the form of waste uh, oils uh, available. Thank you. Thank you, Philip. Uh, Michael, I believe you want to respond. I'll give you the floor. Yes, thank you, Sean. Uh, thank you, Director Cornelis. Um, we are puzzled that uh, the Commission has presented a draft blending mandate in late 2020 before the impact assessment. And after the impact assessment, the numbers are exactly the same. And in the impact assessment, there are no figures on UCO availability in 2030. It only says there will be enough. Um, but, uh, and we represent the industry that has increased the collection of uh, used cooking oil and to maximize the use in biofuels production. And we have seen that this has now matured and um, the rate of increase is now single digit percentage. Um, also, we have moved into UCO household collection and that is difficult, it's expensive and um, it, it shows to us that availability doesn't equal collectability. So I think we have uh, the credibility of knowing how much we can uh, collect and make available. But more importantly, we're speaking here about the architecture of the proposed regulation. And we have a similar example in Norway. So we, we just need to look at the facts. The, the Norwegian um, mandate is similar to the EU proposal in the sense that it excludes first generation crop based. It um, goes for advanced and um, it is a, a separate aviation blending mandate. So very similar to the EU proposal. Well, guess what? The statistics are out. All, and I repeat, 100% of the feedstock used are waste lipids, which means there was no incentive to create and invest novel pathways and novel feedstocks. And um, this is uh, what we see is lacking in the EU Commission's proposal. Again, we want to decarbonize with novel pathways in aviation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to um, turn to some of our other panelists. Um, maybe, um, Daniel, um, I can turn to you. Um, so Germany has put a focus um, rather than on uh, waste-based biofuels on e-fuels, I believe. Um, but my understanding is that creating these sustainable e-fuels requires a huge amount of renewable electricity um, to carry out the electrolysis. Um, given the energy issues we're seeing, can we really put so much of our renewable energy towards producing these fuels? Won't it just leave a hole elsewhere, uh, elsewhere that will need to be plugged with less sustainable energy? Well, um, the, the, the first thing I, I'd like to say is that um, uh, the, the discussion we, we, we heard uh, between um, uh, the Commission and, and Ivava shows, shows clearly that uh, um, obviously there is, uh, there is not enough uh, feedstock. The feedstock is limited. That, that is something we, we, have to, we have to agree on. Um, so diverting from from one place to another is is uh, certainly not the solution. But I do understand the reasoning of the of the Commission that um, in road transport, and is, that is something that, that Germany also supports um, uh, in in road transport. Once um, uh, electrification is uh, reached a, a certain level, there is obviously a, a, a certain amounts of of, uh, of 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 feedstock that that can also be be used in uh, in um, in other sectors. Um, 
Now, uh, the issue of, of uh, renewable electricity, well, as I said in the beginning, um, there, there's, there's, there's no point in uh, um, promoting renewable um, fuels only makes sense when you, um, when, you, when you have new sources. So uh, in order to, to, to achieve uh, climate neutrality, uh, you have to expand also the, the production of renewable electricity, obviously. Um, that is also something um, um, the Commission um, addresses. Um, the RED um, has a, um, a delegated act uh, uh, that is uh, coming out hopefully very soon that addresses this, this issue of additionality, of course. But uh, in aviation, there's, there's no other option. And aviation uh, needs uh, those fuels. Uh, when we talk about road transport, then, then I absolutely agree that, that those fuels um, uh, which, which need a lot of electricity, um, should not be used um, uh, too much. But in aviation, there's, there's no other option. Thank you. Uh, Chelsea, I believe that you would also like to come in on this question. Yes, I think this highlights a really important issue that we need to deploy renewable electricity in Europe using every lever we can. And it's very important that electrofuels are made of renewable electricity and that this renewable electricity is additional. So right now um, within the Renewable Energy Directive, they're actually working on a delegated act that we expect this year that should address this issue. And this is something that could be applied to e-fuels in the aviation sector as well, because if there is um, grid electricity being used, which is not 100% renewable today, e-fuels are actually um, a sustainability risk. So it's really important that we're focusing on producing them with just zero carbon electricity. Thank you, Chelsea. Um, and Michael, I believe you also want to comment on this topic. I'm very glad that Chelsea mentioned the word addition additional. So we all agree on additionality. And I hope we are all against cannibalization of better, more efficient and more GHG reducing options. But I would like to um, go back to the uh, electromobility that uh, Daniel uh, mentioned. Um, uh, Vice Pre EU Commission Vice President Timmermans mentioned last December when he announced the sustainable uh, mobility uh, package that he expects, the Commission expects, in 2030 around 80 plus percent of the vehicles on EU roads to still have a combustion engine. So we are speaking about a slow transition and hopefully if we manage it will be more. Um, so all these vehicles will need liquid fuels with low carbon emissions and this is what we are offering. Uh, so we the, uh, the liquid fuels in road transportation are relevant for the next 10, 15, even uh, more years. But I'll give you also another example. We should not um, uh, have uh, road against aviation. It's terrestrial fuels um, uh, against aviation. So we also should include shipping. And I will give you an example. We, my company, we have a plant in northern Germany in the port of Emden. And very close to us, there is the Volkswagen plant that is changing its production to electric vehicles. Well, guess what? For their shipping of the vehicles and their parts, they use our uh, renewable biodiesel. So there is a lot to be done in a more effective way on Earth than in aviation. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Philip, I'd like to go to you to hear your views on the electrofuels discussion. Yes, I mean, this is a, also a very important part of our uh, approach. And um, we, we do share the view uh, that exists in, in Germany uh, very much that uh, the, the future, particularly in the longer term, is synthetic fuels. Uh, but as Chelsea was saying, um, uh, and Daniel as well, they need to be produced from truly green electricity. And here we are still facing a, a need for massive investment in additional uh, green electricity production. Uh, and, and from that can come uh, that synthetic fuel also for aviation. We envisage that the share of synthetic fuels will overtake the share of uh, bio-based uh, fuels 
um, uh, sometime uh, um, in the middle between now and, and 2050. Uh, and, and synthetic fuels will be the majority of fuels by, by 2050. Um, and we are uh, trying to help kickstart that uh, sector, which is more or less at zero uh, today, by including in our proposal a, a sub mandate of 0.7. Uh, percent uh, synthetic uh, fuels by 2030 and then rising uh, rather rapidly already 5% by 2035, 20% by 2040 uh, and forward. Um, so um, uh, the question is here, we need to push that industry to, to invest and, and start production, but we have to move carefully because um, we need the green electricity on the one hand uh, and we need also to see how uh, this works out in practice because there's very little experience on the industrial scale. So it's definitely a part of our uh, way forward, uh, but we also need uh, the bio-based fuels, particularly in the, in the next decade or two. Uh, and that is why our proposal is uh, based on both uh, sources at the same time, because it's the only way that we are going to uh, decarbonize aviation in any significant way in the next uh, 10 uh, to 20 years. Thank you very much. Uh, Michael, I believe you want to give a brief comment in response. Yes, I'm glad we agree on something <laughs> um, next to decarbonizing aviation uh, with Mr. Cornelis. We agree on scaling up e-fuels. Um, this is very important and we, we are saying it's, it's good that the Commission attempts to decarbonize um, aviation fuels, it just doesn't support e-fuels enough, it doesn't support other pathways enough like fissure troughs, alcohol to jet, and as we said, power to lipids. So um, we would encourage um, uh, the EU institutions, the Parliament and the Council in the consultations that will follow in the next months to increase those um, targets for the simple reason, and that's where we disagree with Mr. Cornelis, that the biofuels already have an existing better use. They reduce more GHGs than if you took the molecules and put them and, and converted them into aviation fuels. So we will be increasing our GHGs. That really doesn't make sense. And this is where um, we disagree and we hope we are constructive in proposing solutions to uh, support the other pathways more. Thank you. Thank you. Um, well, Thomas, I'd like to go to you now, please. Um, so sustainable aviation fuels, they're more expensive than kerosene. They're between three to five times the price. Um, is this a concern for airlines that, that this uh, fuel is more expensive? And when coupled with a, a potential tax on kerosene, and the proposed removal of carbon permits for European aviation. Um, are we about to see the cost of flying go up as a result? Yeah, thanks, Sean. Thanks for uh, giving, getting me back to the floor as, uh, as uh, representing the users, uh, the airlines here, uh, which is kind of important in this whole discussion. Um, well, first of all, I mean, CEFs are considered to be, just to repeat it, I think it was quite clear, but to be the most effective and realistic means to reduce aviation uh, emissions over the next decades. Um, our study, the Destination 2050, has clearly shown this, as well as many other studies. Uh, and we will continue uh, to use them long term uh, for decarbonizing long haul flights, uh, where alternatives to liquid fuel will not be available within the foreseeable time frame. I mean, we're talking about hydrogen uh, commercially available um, uh, as early as, as 2035. Uh, but until we get there, uh, before we can roll out, for instance, take the example of hydrogen combustion, uh, to be clear, uh, it, it will take a while um, uh, until until we get there. So, so yes, uh, SAFs are more expensive than kerosene. It will have a significant impact on airlines' business uh, overall, its operations. It might possibly also have an impact on the ticket prices and the connectivity. Um, if SAF prices don't go down very quickly. And it's also related, um, as the Commission may appreciate, to the level of the uh, competit competitiveness uh, of the market uh, going forward. Um, we need financial support systems, therefore, to reduce uh, the price of SAFs um, and to de-risk investments. Uh, um, I'm talking um, financial support mechanisms like grants, loans, uh, 
pricing support mechanisms. And um, instead of increasing the price of CO2 uh, and kerosene, we should also look at reducing the set prices. And so if you look at uh, what the US uh, government is doing, uh, I know uh, uh, the structure, uh, uh, the state structure is quite different and the competences differ quite a bit between the US and, and the EU and the European Commission's role in this. Um, but uh, we see that we like the fact that the US is using the carrot rather than just a stick, uh, which we uh, traditionally do uh, use in, in Europe uh, too often. SAFs can so reduce greenhouse gas emissions, we said before, but up to 85% in the best case compared to the conventional jet fuels. Let's not forget that. Uh, they have, of course, a unique advantage of being uh, drop-in fuels. So the engines uh, we use today uh, and we will be using for the next couple of decades uh, are perfectly uh, uh, fit to do that. Today's engines uh, are allowed uh, to use, according to the standard, up to 50% of a blend, but we can, uh, we can increase that with the right standard. Uh, in other words, um, you know, CEFs, uh, the fuels which are used in today's aircraft can uh, accommodate uh, 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 the sufficient amount of quantities of SAFs if they're available. So technically, there's there's not a problem, uh, but we all know that currently, I think it's about 1% of the SAF is available for airlines. I think Philippe referred to that. So we need to um, uh, uh, do something very urgently about the insufficiency of the production for the, for the aviation. We welcome, by the way, just want to underline, we welcome SA3, the Commission's uh, Refuel EU proposal as it also aims clearly to tackle the, the barriers to insufficient SAF production. Um, and uh, the fact is that aviation uh, needs to be, in our view, prioritized over the other sectors. Uh, road has been mentioned. Other sectors which actually have clear other alternative uh, uh, technological alternatives. I mean, the decision was quasi being made by Europe uh, for the personal vehicles to be electrified. And that's the future as far as this, uh, personal vehicles is concerned. In terms of flying, flying will become more expensive of increased SAF use. That sees that needs to be determined. It's, uh, the pricing of a ticket uh, is very complex, um, as you might have experienced also as a passenger. So it's too soon to say. Um, the Destination 2050 roadmap report um, released earlier this year showed that uh, a combination of measures really will help us to achieve net zero two emissions. For us, it's important that we look at the total picture, not of course SAF. Today's debate is about SAF, but we shouldn't forget the total picture because if we just look at SAF and just focus on SAF, uh, aviation will not be successful uh, short and long term uh, to get to, uh, to net zero. Um, I think maybe one important point to mention is that um, in our all, whole plan to get to net zero, Let's not forget that we will be able uh, to be able to grow, according to our report, 1.4% uh, of passengers per year, uh, which is uh, which is actually the good news uh, without compromising ourselves uh, to uh, uh, to our uh, net zero uh, uh, objectives. Um, and um, uh, maybe to finish that is uh, it, the whole discussion, one point I wanted to point out is on SAF, but also the other measures. It points out that we can uh, decarbonize uh, aviation. It can be achieved uh, without uh, introducing uh, new taxes on aviation, such as the fuel tax, which is proposed by Fit for 55. Thank you, Thomas. Um, Chelsea, I'd also be uh, interested to hear your views on this discussion. I'll go to you now, please. Um, thank you. So as Thomas just said, we don't really know exactly how this is going to affect prices, but it will likely raise prices, um, but this just shows how for a long time the aviation sector has been insulated from feeling the effects of any policies. Um, they've been received exceptions from the emissions trading scheme and there was no tax on kerosene. So it's good that we're starting to incorporate um, carbon pricing into the sector. Um, I will also note that we expect that at the quantities in the earlier term, so around 2030, 2035, um, the impact on prices will be muted. Um, and yeah, actually, that's, that's what I was going to say. <laughs> Great, thank you. Well, Daniel, I'd like to ask you uh, the same question. Uh, what's your, from a German perspective, um, this idea that these green measures could um, push up prices for, for German consumers, is this, a, is this a concern? 
Um, it certainly is. Uh, we uh, we made some preliminary uh, calculations. Um, uh, obviously, um, um, the, the the whole Fit, fit for Fifty Five uh, package uh, uh, has to be looked at in in, in total. Uh, different measures in in aviation lead to to prices. Um, now. Um, Obviously, the package is uh, being discussed in, in different working groups, uh, different uh, um, uh, legislations, different proposals are, are being discussed. So um, in every step of the way, we will have to, to, to calculate um, uh, what the impact of the prices is, uh, of course. Um, but again, um, those measures have to be taken. Um, uh, and uh, um, sure, uh, the prices will increase in in, in aviation, uh, but in order to reach uh, uh, climate neutrality, uh, the, they have to be taken. Well, thank you very much, um, Philip. I, I believe you'd also like to comment on uh, the issue of prices. Yes. So um, it's clear that there is going to be a price impact from the Fit for Fifty Five uh, proposals on the aviation sector. Uh, we've calculated that um, uh, the SAF mandate uh, on its own will uh, increase the fuel cost for airlines by about 3% by 2030, with an impact on ticket prices of about 1% by 2030. Uh, and this is simply because uh, sustainable fuels continue to be uh, more expensive than, than kerosene, uh, between two and, and five times uh, more expensive. Of course, we hope over time, with increases in production and uh, uh, and learning in the industry uh, and possibly new technologies that uh, the, the price gap will uh, diminish, but uh, we, we don't expect it to disappear uh, completely. So there is going to be a price impact. Of course, it will uh, grow further towards the middle of the century. We expect about 8% impact on uh, ticket prices from the, the SAF mandate, although this is quite far uh, in the future. Nevertheless, we see a, a, a great deal of support in the industry, which is very welcome. And uh, I think the European airlines are ready uh, and the passengers are ready to, to shoulder that um, additional cost. But we have to keep uh, in mind that this needs to be manageable. And one of the objectives that we pursue with our balanced proposal, um, balanced in the, in the sense of a, of, of a gradual ramp up and balanced in the sense that we are relying on all possible pathways, uh, both synthetic and bio and different forms of, of bio uh, sources. Uh, one of the reasons we want to do that is because we need to make sure that the industry is actually able to uh, bring those fuels to the market and that we don't create with our mandate an artificial fuel shortage uh, in the coming years uh, and decades. So that's really been a, a strong focus from our side. And uh, all this is uh, is very well documented in the, the studies that we have published uh, uh, and we and that are based on the uh, indications that we've received from the, from the industry. Uh, and that's why uh, we believe this is a, a balanced and realistic uh, and also ambitious uh, proposal we're putting on the table. And we're very encouraged by a strong support we are seeing from the airlines from the fuels industry uh, as well as from member states and, and members of the European Parliament and I do hope that it can be adopted uh, relatively quickly uh, possibly become law uh, by uh, 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 sometime next year. Thank you and uh, Michael I'd like to give you the floor for your comments please. Yes thank you Sean. Um, so Philip we had the conversation on um, the in the EU institutions when we agreed the RAD2 there was a proposed excess incentivization of aviation back then that was scaled back when people realized that um, if you if you close down better alternatives uh, better plants uh, that's not an option and I'm glad to hear that uh, the commission is looking into other options like scalable feedstocks, uh, there are several options like agricultural residues, forestry residues, municipal solid waste, cellulosic uh, material, so very glad to hear that. Um, and a, a comment on the prioritization. Uh, thank you, Thomas, for this um, for using this word. I think we all agree that we prioritize climate 
mitigation in a holistic way. And again, we fully support constructively the decarbonization of aviation fuels. Uh, we just uh, uh, advocate for a level playing field of technologies um, that will not reduce, they will not increase GAGs um, overall for the EU by replacing existing better uses. So we prioritize climate mitigation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I also want to take uh, some questions from the chat. Um, there's a question from uh, Antti Tolonen uh, for Chelsea. Um, it said, Chelsea, you referred to presumed lack of waste and residue lipids for SAF. Is there a consideration for other sources for HEFA, municipal waste, agricultural waste, wood processing waste, etc., which are vastly more available and becoming usable? Um, do you have a response to that? Yeah, so that's a good question. Um, these technologies that are necessary to convert these wastes are all very different. So HIFA can only use oily feedstocks. So for low carbon, that would be just waste oils. Um, to convert agricultural residues or municipal solid waste, these are Annex 9A waste in the red too. That's a little bit detailed, but some policymakers will know what I'm talking about. Those require um, a different pathway called gasification and then refining by Fisher troughs. And that's a more nascent technology. Um, so to really scale up, we should be supporting these technologies in the near term, really in the next five years to get them built. Um, and HIFA doesn't need any more support. Um, it can't really scale up and it's already commercialized. Um, so it is really important to make that distinction. Thank you. Um, Michael, would you like to comment on this? Yes, I, uh, nothing more than I fully agree with Chelsea. We have a, a mature technology, HIFA, so the transformation of uh, lipids into aviation fuels that will, through the current architecture of the proposal, be um, unfairly advantaged uh, at the expense of uh, better, more GHG reducing alternatives. So we constructively advocate for the other novel pathways like the UK or Germany are doing. Um, there's another uh, question for you, Michael. Um, it says, could you elaborate how total GHG emissions will increase if fuel made from waste lipids are diverted to the aviation? Wouldn't the consumption of the fuel be the same? No, we um, commissioned a study by a reputable uh, Dutch consultant, Studio Girap, and they looked at um, how efficient it is to convert the same biomolecules, the same lipids, into either uh, road and, and a shipping biodiesel or HVO for road and shipping and HEFA for aviation. And um, definitely because the aviation process is much more energy intensive, it emits more GAGs or the other perspective is it reduces much less uh, GAGs. So um, there will be millions of tons of more GAGs that the EU will emit by diverting those molecules. Um, we are happy to give more uh, concrete numbers um, after this event if somebody is interested. Thank you. Uh, Philip, I believe you would also like to comment. Yes, because I, I really have to take issue with the, the claim that somehow our proposals will increase uh, greenhouse gas emissions in Europe. This is absolutely ridiculous uh, assertion and, um, and there is no evidence for that at all. Uh, what we are doing is, is on the contrary, we are finally going uh, to um, uh, take measures to significantly reduce in-sector emissions uh, in a sector that has in the past uh, mostly been uh, paying for emission reductions in other sectors through the ETS and, and offsetting. Uh, so the claim that somehow we would increase greenhouse gas emissions is absolutely uh, preposterous. Uh, I want to add that um, uh, clearly there are uh, many uh, pathways uh, available and hopefully even more in the future. Different types of feedstock 
uh, need to be uh, collected and 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 indeed uh, other types uh, from industrial waste and so on also need to be uh, tapped into we are looking here at a massive uh, a scaling up of uh, production of uh, sustainable fuels in Europe over the next years and decades that will uh, 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 that will need to uh, collect uh, and harvest all kinds of additional uh, feedstock. Of course, this is going to be complicated. It's going to cost money, um, but it has to be done because of the scale at which we need to uh, produce those fuels in order to decarbonize uh, different sectors uh, in particular aviation that needs to rely on liquid fuels for some time to come and our view uh, is that there are no feedstocks reserved for any particular use uh, and uh, we are uh, promoting an overall policy to decarbonize different sectors uh, different modes of transport with all the means that are available and we do take issue with those who claim that somehow a certain feedstock should be reserved for certain uses. Thank you. Um, Chelsea, I believe you also want to add to this. Yeah, I would like to respond to both of the last two answers. So to follow up on what Michael was saying to provide a little bit more information, um, if you're diverting waste oils from the road sector to aviation, that is much more energy intensive. Um, it requires more hydrogen for hydro processing and the refining of aviation fuels, if you're maximizing for those, um, is less efficient than putting them into the road sector. Um, not to mention that um, biodiesel is um, a much less expensive process than um, HIFA or hydro, hydro processing. Um, it's also the case that in the near term, fossil diesel is more carbon intensive than jet kerosene. So if you're replacing jet kerosene, you're receiving less of a carbon benefit um, in the near term than if you were replacing fossil diesel. Um, and to respond to what Philip's saying, it is the case that if you put HIFA into the aviation sector, you're reducing in-sector emissions, but that's not cross-sector. That's merely an accounting gimmick to reduce greenhouse gas emissions um, in aviation, but to divert that from the road sector. Um, we are very hesitant that there would be any real reduction um, in greenhouse gas emissions across the entire transportation sector. But I do agree that we need to scale up these fuels now. That's why we need to create the proper policy incentives for other advanced wastes. Um, in the next five years, we are importing a lot of waste oils um, from Asia, but that carries fraud risk. Um, we've seen that in the news. It's very possible that those wastes could be actually disguised palm oil. Uh, thank you. Um, Michael, would you like to respond? Yes. Um, I, my response would be that we need a holistic approach. That's all. But um, it's good to also mention figures. So nobody has disputed the study I mentioned earlier, so that um, converting waste mo lipid molecules into terrestrial fuels is more efficient than into aviation. And the figures are very clear. You achieve a 90% GAG saving when you convert the same molecule into terrestrial fuels for road and shipping, and only 76% for heifer. So by diverting, we are increasing GAGs. I'm sorry to state that. And again, we want to be constructive and we're very happy to uh, work together to, for novel pathways that truly additionally reduce uh, GAGs. Uh, thank you. Um, Philip, I want to give you the floor to briefly respond and then I want to go to Thomas. But Philip, I'll give you the floor first. Yes, well, I mean, as I said at the beginning, we're very familiar with the view of Ewaba, who is representing a particular uh, type of uh, producers, fuel producers, who are using uh, those uh, animal, those um, uh, waste lipids uh, as, as feedstock. And of course, they want to protect their uh, sourcing uh, of of those feedstocks, that's absolutely uh, understood. And that's what a industry association like Ewaba uh, would be expected to do. But uh, I'm afraid that in the bigger picture, uh, this uh, doesn't add up. Uh, and what we are trying to do is to uh, put in place policies that will decarbonize all the modes of transport. In the past, most of the effort has gone to road because as you were saying, indeed, it's easier to produce 
sustainable fuels for uh, the road sector. Uh, jet fuel is uh, requiring uh, a more complex uh, production process, um, uh, uh, as is the case, uh, I think, even for the fo fossil part. Uh, but we do need to uh, channel those fuels also into aviation because we need to have these uh, emission reductions both in road transport and in aviation. And that is why our proposals are not diverting the effort or are not increasing greenhouse gas emissions, but are going to overall significantly reduce uh, emissions uh, from uh, transport, uh, different modes taken together. That is a, a consistent and holistic policy uh, from the Commission side, which I believe is very much supported by the wider industry, by most NGOs uh, and by the member states. Well, thank you, Philip. Um, Thomas, I, I want to turn to you now. Um, so I, I have a question about the, the SAF mandate um, more generally. Um, you've said that it could harm, uh, I believe A4E's position, and correct me if I'm wrong, I believe A4E's position is that um, uh, the SAF mandate, if applied to long-haul flights, it could harm the competitiveness of European airlines and lead to market uh, distortions. Um, but it's also the case that long-haul flights represent the most uh, polluting journeys. Um, do you think the mandate will harm competitiveness? And if not a SAF mandate, how can long-haul be decarbonized? Yeah, thanks, Sean. Uh, thanks for uh, coming back to, the, to, to this point. Um, a couple of things in the context have been said, I think, but let me just try to, to summarize here. Um, I mean, there are many ways uh, that SAFs can be supported, first of all. Uh, blending mandate is, is only one of them. I think it's a good one. Uh, but it will only be success if it becomes uh, if it comes alongside other developments, uh, for instance, you know, policy framework to support the production and deployment of SAFs in Europe, uh, build on clear objectives with a robust life cycle assessment. Uh, I think we know that also, you know, clear validation methodology, uh, which is you know really neutral towards conversion technology and raw materials. Um, also thinking of coherent support scheme for SAF technology development and capacity build up in Europe, uh, support for the production and the availability of feedstock for SAP production, I think some being referred to, um, and industrial alliances, which, which are important, um, not only from a Brussels perspective, such as the, um, the European SAF Alliance to really share information and collectively discuss the right policies and necessary funding. Those things are very important. Uh, the decarbonization uh, to your question, Sean, is, is um, well, of aviation is per definition a global endeavor. It's not only Europe's uh, uh, problem to solve or challenge. Uh, we could take the lead on this uh, from a SAF perspective, but long term ambitions can only be realized at the global level. I think the European Commission is also very well aware of that. And I think that under the leadership of the EU, Collectively, industry and governments, we need to join forces to realize the European ambitions elsewhere in the world and maintain and evolve Europe's leading position in sustainable aviation as a whole as we get there. Now, ensuring a level playing field for European carriers vis-a-vis -vis the non-EU carriers, which is, of course, one of the big discussions, uh, non-EU carriers who are competing on the same markets uh, is an issue. Um, and um, possibly also in the context of the, the carbon border adjustment mechanism, uh, that, that's a very important discussion. So we need to ensure the level playing field because we're a global industry. So we need to find a solution to that. Um, um, again, you know, since we're one of the sectors, probably the hardest hit sector uh, hit by the pandemic, and with an essential role in kickstarting societal and economic recovery, like we've seen with the, the cargo business, uh, the future uh, EU policies really must guarantee 100% support of our sector's competitiveness. Um, otherwise, this is going to be a very sort of short-term uh, 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 sort of path to to a solution. Otherwise, it's and it's not just aviation which is affected, but it's going to be the entire aviation ecosystem, Europe's tourism industry, and the wider EU economy. So I think it would have unfortunately ripple down effect if we don't tackle this in the right. Uh, if we don't tackle this with a global ambition. Uh, another example of the risk of uh, market distortion can be found in the revision of the energy taxation directive. Um, the fact is that, um, you know, I think really badly designed European taxes will not reduce emissions um, by making flying just more expensive. It may shift demand globally and it will also reduce traffic locally. 
um, but it will not tackle the source of the emissions. And that's what, you know, the theme of today, uh, after all, sustainability, environment sustainability. And so we need to invest in solutions that offer real solutions in CO2 emissions uh, for the aircraft, uh, for the airline sector. And of course, here, SAFS is taking one of the, the four main four pillars is one of taking one of the roles uh, uh, going forward. So any SAF mandate, which is only applicable to European carriers, would distort, com distort competition globally. I think that's evident. Uh, it's in nobody's interest, uh, not the least of which the consumers uh, who are not at the table today, but the passengers, who is used to, you know, healthy competitive market, affordable prices, great destinations, um, actually having access to the best connectivity, which we certainly had before COVID-19. Uh, uh, COVID um, there's also high risk of tankering fuel outside of Europe uh, to avoid such a mandate and with that carbon leakage, carbon leakage would therefore, will therefore need to be mitigated through appropriate measures such as uniform regulations, carbon board adjustments, uh, as I mentioned, or designated finance mechanism preserving the competition neutrality. So I thought I don't think we're there yet. Uh, I do think that it will be. It is one of the pain points, and will continue to be one of the pain points uh, in the discussions uh, in, in the fit fit for fifty five. Thank you very much, Thomas. Um, I have another question from the chat that I want to put uh, forward. It's uh, for Philip. Um, it's from Christopher Surgener. It says, can Philip comment on the United States approach of a uh, blender's tax credit rather than a blending mandate? As Thomas said, it's more carrot than the EU stick. How would you uh, respond, Philip? Well, first of all, I wouldn't call our approach a stick. Uh, what we are uh, putting in place uh, is a, a blending mandate. Uh, the purpose of this is to create a legal certainty for uh, fuel producers and, and airlines that uh, there is going to be a certain uh, demand, a growing demand for uh, those sustainable fuels despite their higher cost. Uh, and in doing that, uh, we will preserve a level playing field, meaning all uh, airlines and airports will uh, be subject to the same uh, environment and therefore be able to continue to compete on equal terms. That is uh, really the, at the heart of our policy uh, because um, that is also where the market failure was, that there was a, a very low and still is a very low level of production of uh, SAF um, for aviation uh, uh, and prices are high and there is a low demand. Uh, and therefore no interest in increasing uh, the production capacity. We will break this chicken and egg situation, this, this standoff uh, with a, a blending mandate. In the US, they have chosen, or they are choosing a, a different path. They are uh, going to work with a, a tax credit for uh, fuel producers. Um, uh, we will have to see uh, which of the two is going to be the most effective. Um, the US ambition is very high. Uh, they are aiming for, um, I believe, around 16% uh, of SAF by 2030. But we have to keep in mind that their uh, approach is more um, uh, aspirational. It's a voluntary system and it will rely on price uh, incentives. Um, we, uh, on our side, um, are, are, are supporting, of course, very much other uh, states taking a, a similar uh, road and, and we see uh, not only US but also UK, Switzerland and others uh, moving in, in the same direction. That is very, very important. In terms of content, there are also some other differences. Our sustainability uh, requirements are higher than in the US where uh, crop-based uh, SAF uh, will still be, uh, be possible. Uh, but um, uh, we are going to be uh, working very closely together. Actually, I have a, a, a meeting or a call uh, with our U.S. counterparts very soon to, to exchange uh, information on our respective uh, approaches and uh, on areas of research and developing and certifying new pathways. Uh, we will definitely continue to cooperate as well as uh, on the promotion of SAF globally. Uh, for example, in the context of the International Civil Aviation Organization uh, that will have its uh, triannual assembly next year, I hope we will be standing side by side with the U.S. to, to promote uh, 
also uh, ambitious SAF uh, targets uh, around the world. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Philip. Um, uh, Michael, I believe you uh, want to uh, give some remarks. I'll give you the floor. I also represent um, a US-based uh, company that is, as I said, the first producer of SAF in North America. So we know how much more inefficient <laughs> the production of SAF is compared to terrestrial fuels. And this is exactly um, what is happening with the US proposal, where there is a $1 uh, blender's credit for terrestrial fuels. The proposal is for a much higher taxpayer's money for the SAF. So why did that happen? Um, I agree here with Philip Cornelis, aviation industry guys, speak to aviation industry guys and reproduce the same uh, results within this sector uh, without looking at it, at the issue uh, cross sectorally. So um, the, the US mandate uh, would also ring fence um, uh, SAF against production of terrestrial fuels that uh, reduce more GAGs and are uh, less um, expensive. So, and just to come back um, to Europe, uh, the, the European proposal, and again, I say we are being constructive here, the proposal actually reserves feedstocks just for aviation use, so it destroys the level playing field of technologies. Um, if there were a level playing field of for the production of terrestrial fuels and for aviation, um, then consumers, as uh, mentioned by Thomas, uh, could then decide where they best reduce uh, GAGs. And yes, it's true, uh, I heard Philip, that Evaba represents a certain industry. As I said, certain members can produce uh, heifer if uh, that is decided. But uh, we've experienced that already, that MEPs and, and the council will not allow 50 plus factories around Europe to close down uh, for a ring-fenced separate mandate for aviation. So we think uh, we should continue to be constructive and improve the support of the novel pathways. Well, thank you very much. Um, well, it's been a, a very spirited debate. And um, unfortunately, though, we are coming to a close. Um, we're running out of time, so we do need to move towards the closing remarks. Um, so I'd ask each of you to summarize the main message that you would like our audience to take home with them. Um, well, let me, let me go back to you, Michael. Um, I'll, I'll give you the floor for your closing remarks, please. Thank you, Sean. Again, we're trying to be constructive and propose higher and earlier a higher and earlier sub-target for e-fuels. That makes sense for climate mitigation holistically. We propose a sub-target for part A, non-waste lipids. And um, waste lipids from parts A and B, if there is a separate blending mandate, they should be out because a separate blending mandate destroys the level playing field of technologies. These are our proposals. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Um, now I'll go to uh, Thomas for your closing remarks, please. Um, just a reminder that we are running low on time, so if you could try and keep your remarks to one minute, that would be much appreciated. Thomas, I'll give you the floor. Yep, thank you. Thank you, Sean. Just to, uh, okay, a couple of points. One is in addition to the mandate, I think to address the price differential compared with fossil fuels, specific policy measures will be needed subsidies, offtake agreements, auctioning mechanisms, capital grants. Second, support for private investments in SAF production and support for further R&D in new SAF feedstock and production pathways are also needed. Third, to make SAFs more affordable and to boost emissions reductions, transparent monitoring and accounting framework is needed, something we did not discuss, but it was very important for airlines. And last but not least, regulatory measures should ensure, I would say, prioritization of feedstock vis-a-vis -vis other transport modes, so I do disagree there with Michael, uh, other transport modes which have other alternative solutions for decarbonization. Aviation does not have any other uh, short to midterm alternatives to uh, carbon based fuels. Thanks. Thank you very much indeed. Um, Chelsea, I'll now go to you for your closing remarks. 
So we have two suggestions. First, to cap the waste oil fuels, that is those used to produce HEFA at 1.7%. There's already a policy precedent for this in the Renewable Energy Directive, and for good reason. Um, this technology is already commercialized, it doesn't need policy support, and these waste oils are already decarbonizing the road sector. Um, in the future, they can decarbonize the marine sector. So if we're really pushing the availability limits of these fuels, we run the risk of fraud. Second, we suggest that policy support focuses on less developed technologies, as Michael was saying, um, which we really need to convert Annex 9A waste and residues, as well as synthetic fuels. The ramp up of these fuels needs to happen now, not after 2030. Thank you, Chelsea. Um, now I'll give the floor to Daniel, your uh, brief closing remarks, please. Thank you. Yes, um, I would like to um, uh, to say what, what, what I already said um, uh, in this discussion. Um, certain feedstocks are limited. Um, uh, we should, should always uh, look uh, at, at how much we have and not divert uh, from, from certain sectors to others. Um, um, but, but coming back to, to, to the proposal by the Commission, there are certain elements that certainly need to be discussed in the Council and, and with Parliament and the Commission. Um, for example, the fact that in 2030 there's a, a lower, lower mandate on, on synthetic aviation fuels as uh, the one that Germany already put in place. This is problematic as um, uh, there were already uh, investments in, in certain plants. So this is something uh, we have to, to, uh, to look into uh, with the Commission and, and with the Council. Um, however, I think those are minor details. Um, the, um, the, uh, um, the, the draft proposal is overall a very good one. And we are also very confident that we will quickly come to an agreement. Thank you, Daniel. Um, and now, Philip, I would give you the floor for your closing remarks, please. Well, I would like to share Daniel's optimism that we hopefully can come to a, a quick agreement on putting in place this, this new and very ambitious uh, approach across Europe. And uh, I know there are different uh, targets already in different member states. We should try to, to bring those together. Uh, let's not forget that with an EU measure, we will have the benefit of uh, enormous scale, uh, continental scale in, in our uh, joint uh, policy. And, and also we will be able to guarantee a uh, level playing field for the, the airlines and, and the airports. That is, that is very important in, in this sector. Um, I, I want to add as well that perhaps uh, this particular debate this morning has a bit uh, has been focusing a little bit excessively on one specific issue, namely the role of waste oils in our overall uh, policy. It is an important uh, discussion, but it's a, a, a small uh, part of the wider discussion. Um, as we are uh, together now uh, uh, at the start of a major transformation of the aviation sector, the uh, role of SAF in that will be absolutely uh, essential. Uh, and we need, and this is clearly the choice of uh, the European Commission, and I believe very soon of the member states and the parliament as well, that we need to put uh, a big effort in the decarbonization of the aviation sector, uh, in addition to the decarbonization of the maritime sector, the road sector, that will rely a lot on electrification. Uh, and for that, uh, we shall not reserve any feedstock for any particular sector. Uh, we need to uh, uh, source much more feedstock. We need to develop new pathways. And we will need all of those uh, together in order to achieve that big transformation that will uh, massively reduce uh, emissions from the transport sector uh, in the future. And at the same time, help uh, transform our energy uh, sector in Europe by uh, building a whole new uh, production, production uh, um, uh, capacity uh, in Europe, reduce our energy dependence uh, and create, in our estimation, uh, 200,000 new jobs in the uh, energy and the fuel production sector alone. Thank you.
Thank you very much indeed, Philip. Well, that uh, sadly brings us to the close of today's conference, um, but I would like to thank all of our panellists for their excellent contributions today. Uh, thank you to Waba for supporting today's debate, and of course, thank you to you, the viewers, for joining us. Um, if you want to watch this virtual conference back, you can find it online at the Your Active YouTube channel. Well, that's all from the Your Active studio for now. In the meantime, take care, stay safe, and we'll see you next time.